This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome board folks. Dr. Charles Parker here one more time at Core Brain Journal. We are so fortunate because we have such a diversity of interesting people that we get a chance to talk to. And today we're going to be honored with the presence of Dr. Devin Houston, who's going to tell me, and I'm going to learn right in front of you guys as I often do here, Dr. Houston is an expert on the work with enzymes as they relate to gut and brain function. Dr. Houston, thank you so much for coming on board. We really appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure, Chuck. So, you know, folks, a lot of people wonder about the whole issue of enzymes. I've wondered about it for years. It's a big controversy. So we're going to enjoy talking to Dr. Houston. But first, before we do that, I'm going to mention a word from our sponsor. Core Brain Journal is sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. They are deep international biomedical testing leaders for improved, targeted mind science details. As both laboratory and webinar global thought leaders, they provide the most comprehensive set of hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond guesswork. And they also provide multiple training webinars for both the public and medical providers on how to use that data effectively in offices globally. Check out their website for references and testing details. And take note of this, folks. Register for a complimentary test drawing. We want you to go over to Great Plains Laboratory for this one. Very frequently, we have a download on the, on the show as well. But the bottom line is, it's going to be greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ. Why not take a look at a OATS organic acid test, 75 specific testing answers from a simple urine sample. That would be an interesting thing in itself. We use them all the time. So now, Dr. Houston, so I'm going to give you folks a little bit of an intro here, and then we're going to ask Dr. Houston to tell us more about himself. But he is the founder and CEO of Houston Enzymes, a division of Houston Nutraceuticals. Dr. Houston obtained his doctorate in biochemistry from the University of South Alabama School of Medicine. His college work, his graduate work, focused on enzyme discovery. Subsequent research at the University of Virginia, right here in our state, and St. Louis University, I used to live in St. Louis, focused on enzyme mechanisms involved in cellular communication. This is what we're talking about. I'm looking forward to this. So Dr. Houston followed his academic career with research and development in in enzyme manufacturing and invented the first digestive enzyme targeted to the unique digestive issues of autism. So Folks, this is going to be interesting. His company, Houston Enzymes, provides a variety of enzyme products for digestive support. Dr. Houston often speaks at autism conferences on how enzymes can play a role in the gut-brain connection. This is a topic we talk about so much here at Gut Core Brain Journal. And Dr. Houston, we're so pleased to have you on board. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself in this. I said a little bit offline. I want to hear more about you and how you got into it, but I have to tell you right now, enzymes, from my limited perspective, are controversial. You know, it's sort of like, well, they're not going to help anything. Don't worry about it. I've heard more negative street talk about enzymes, and that's why I'm so eager to have you on board because it doesn't match what one intuitively would think about things like long-chain gluten and casein and so on. It's like, hey, well, what do they actually do? How could they actually work? So, Thank you so much for coming on board. Tell us, Dr. Houston, how you made that switch. It sounds like you got into the enzyme company and you then became even more interested from something you started in your graduate work. Yeah, you know, uh, I was your typical product of U.S. medical school training, basically. Mm -hmm. And I fully expected to stay in academics. I was trained uh, in a unique program. It was unique at the time. It was a program designed to train basically PhD level students, uh, but to train them, give them some familiarity with medicine itself. So I took the first two years of medical school as part of the uh, uh, program, 
And that was to enable us to communicate with MDs and surgeons who often saw a lot of interesting phenomenon during their practices, and but had no way or couldn't figure out a way to do the research on it. So we, we were that liaison, that bridge between observation in an operating room and the laboratory, basically. So, um, yeah, I cut my tooth. I, I did my graduate training in a lab that was based on enzyme purification and discovery. So I was more interested in metabolic type enzymes and uh, things like triose phosphate isomerase and phosphodesterase uh, were enzymes I looked at. It was a great experience. I worked in the same department as uh, uh, the department chairman was Joe McCord, who was the discoverer of superoxide dismutase, SOD. Really? And, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was one of my mentors as well. So it was uh, a very great time. It just actually furthered my interest in other areas. And I knew I needed to broaden my horizons just past enzymes because you have to you can understand enzymes or I can understand enzymes, but you have to have a way to apply that to something else. So I went into um, a lab at uh, University of Virginia where they were looking at the adenosine receptor in the brain and heart. So I started looking about G protein coupled receptors and signal transduction mechanisms. Three years later, I went to St. Louis University and uh, similar, same area, but different receptor. This was the cannabinoid receptor, the marijuana receptor, basically. But it all involved enzymes. There was these GTPases and kinases and sets that were all developed. But this was the 90s. NIH funding was drying up and it was hard for young investigators to move forward because mm -hmm. established investigators were staying in place longer. And uh, I, I did have a uh, research track faculty position at St. Louis University, but I could see the writing on the wall. So I decided to look elsewhere. And this is interesting. Uh, this, I was living in St. Louis and in southern Missouri near, near Branson, I uh, happened to uh, hear about a, they were advertising for a uh, director of research and development position. Really? Well, in southern Missouri near Branson? Yeah, yeah. This, is mean, national, this is where an enzyme manufacturer was located. Oh, my gosh. I had no idea. And I did it basically on a lark. I was putting out resumes and, um, you know, right and left. So I put it and they called me down for an interview. And I will have to admit, uh, much to my chagrin, I was a very arrogant, patronizing person. Because, mm -hmm. oh, this is... The dietary supplement industry, come on, that's you know, snake oil, you know, none yeah, of that. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, uh, and I said, I remember distinctly, there was another guy interviewing me, and, um, and he had been in the uh, industrial enzyme business for quite some time. And I just kind of like, come on, this is all, this is all kind of a, a joke in it. I was taught that any enzyme, an enzyme being a protein, you're going to eat it, it's going to be natured. During the, you know, in the stomach acid and the digestive process, how could they possibly have any activity? And he just kind of looked at me and he said, uh, do you know that for a fact that all enzymes are that way? Or are you just regurgitating your medical school or education? And I had to admit, yeah, I was. <laughs> right. Ouch, ouch. And he said, uh, why don't you go back to St. Louis and do a little research on your own and we'll think about contacting you. So <laughs> they did. And I, I had to admit, I started looking at, in medical school, we were taught pancreatic enzymes. There was one lecture I remember on, on digestive enzymes. And it was basically like, there's nothing there. They're already well known, not exciting, pretty boring. You know, and they said, you know, pancreatic enzymes can't be given orally unless they're enteric coated because they are denatured under acidic conditions. Stomach acid will kill them. Plant-based enzymes, no, that's not true. Enzymes derived from uh, non-mammalian species are actually acid-stable, acid-resistant. So they mm -hmm. actually survive and actually have a pH optimum of around uh, two to four. So really? that's perfect for the stomach. Now tell people what that means real quickly because... Yeah. That means yeah. the, the stomachs, if you take an enzyme supplement, the enzyme is actually going to start working right there and the, start breaking down food while it's there in the stomach which is some two to three hours earlier than what's normally going to occur because it takes that long for the stomach to get the food into a certain consistency to pass it on to the small intestine. So you're gaining a fit. That's one of the big advantages of an enzyme supplement. But I spent three years there at that manufacturer learning, learning the trade. And um, 
it's also where the last vestiges of, uh, of ivory tower academics got wiped away when I started attending autism conferences and saw the, the devastation that these families were dealing with. And something I hadn't realized before were that food intolerances were a big part of the uh, autism spectrum disorder. Yeah. So it was very intriguing into, from an intellectual standpoint, but also for the first time in my life, I was seeing just how science could intervene and, and make lives better for these families. So mm -hmm. it was a real um, eye-opener to me, basically coming out of the lab and, and getting involved with other people. So. That's amazing. So you had a transformational experience. I mean, it's rare that you hear somebody having a transformational experience in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm from Missouri. I've been down. I haven't been to Branson per se, but I've done presentations down in, Spr in Springfield. And then I lived in Dexter, Missouri, in Swamp East, Missouri. Mm. I lived down there for five years during the Korean War. Oh, My dad okay. flew an AT-6 and an, a T-33 jet at the Air Force there you go. Uh, training down there. So I see. That's why we live down there. But, but uh, you know, it's, you think of Missouri as kind of a wash. You know, what's going on in Missouri, you know? Yeah, it is. And, uh, it, yeah, it was amazing to me that this little manufacturing company, and to be honest, their, at the time, their science was and their lab facilities were – were not good. And so mm -hmm. that was one of the first things I did when I came in was revamp their, their laboratory and made it more, I revamped it more from a quality control standpoint to a research and development lab. So we were doing more actual experimental type things. And that came in handy. What actually started my whole thing was being tasked by a client or a customer of the manufacturer. And uh, they were looking for an enzyme to help with encasing breakdown. And gluten and casein are two proteins that are found in wheat. Gluten is found in wheat. Casein is found in dairy. And there was something that I never heard of it called the gluten-free casein-free diet or the GFCF diet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, I, this was all new to me. And they uh -huh. were talking about these peptides that are produced during digestion of wheat and dairy products that cause these kids all sorts of troubles and stuff. And I basically asked, can you find an enzyme that would let these kids have a little bit of respite from this very restrictive diet? So mm -hmm. I gave it a shot. And we, we put together a, a high protease formula. And, you know, it took me about two weeks. Gave it to the company. And they did open label kind of informal, not well-controlled studies. Basically, they handed out the product to parents and asked for feedback. <laughs> yeah. They called me back and said, we have gotten some unreal, almost unbelievable responses from these parents. And it was amazing to me. They were talking about uh, kids who had been previously nonverbal, starting to talk, or those who could say a few words were talking more, better socialization skills, better eye contact. Remarkable. I mean, these were things I think, well, that's kind of amazing for something that just kind of helps with bloating and gassiness. So I became rather intrigued and I looked to the medical literature and found that um, there was a particular enzyme I never heard of before called uh, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP4. And it's the only known enzyme that can break down one of the peptides that we're talking about, casomorphin and glutamorphin, which are the peptides from casein and gluten. And uh, it's produced, humans produce it in the GI tract. So I started putting two and two together, and I wondered if some of the observations that these parents were seeing, again, I've been trained to correlate observations by one group and translate that to the laboratory. So I took that and wondered, not no wonder, well, I know these enzymes that we use in these products are actually blends, and there are undocumented what we call side activities, additional activities that have not really been fully documented. So I went down to the lab, had them, we put together an assay for this particular enzyme, this DPP4 enzyme. Lo and behold, the product that we had developed for this company was just chock full of the DPP4 activity. So this is what I like to call one of those eureka moments where a scientist throws up his hands in the lab and says, eureka, because he's got an explanation for, that explains his observations mm -hmm. and, uh, that makes sense scientifically. So I went back and I said, look, yeah, we've got this activity we found called DPP-4, and it's known to break down 
peptides that are produced during normal digestion. And maybe this is why these kids are improving. They're opiate-like, so they produce opiate behaviors, dulling the senses, lack of pain sensitivity, slow gut motility and such. So that wow. was the start. That was 99. It was presented at a Defeat Autism Now conference. And um, that's when enzyme supplements became a very hot topic in the autism community. And it's amazing to me. And it's, that was almost 20 years ago. And we've seen, you talk to any parent who deals with autism, they've seen a lot of things come and go. You know, I'm, in my mind, I'm going through at least five different things that were thought to be the thing, the bullet, or the magic stone that would solve everything. And mm. it turned out to be nothing. So if, if something's not working, if something's not doing what it says, it says it's not going to stay around. And we've been around now for 18 years and uh, still going strong. And uh, enzyme supplements are considered a mainstay in uh, nutritional therapy for, for these kids on the spectrum. And that's now expanded to actually a lot of the mainstream doctors are becoming interested because, well, take schizophrenia. That's often called adult onset autism. Mm -hmm. and there are many characteristics between autism and schizophrenia. I talked to a, a chiropractor in West Virginia who uses, um, sees a lot of uh, very indigent poor patients on a pro bono basis. She had a schizophrenic man who was, who was violent, aggressive, and basically under restraints for a long time. And she put him, changed his diet, put him on enzyme supplementation, and um, along with, I believe, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and saw tremendous changes in his behavior wow. and his mindset. Mm -hmm. So the connection between diet and gut and brain is really laid out there. So there's definitely a connection now. And it's well accepted now that the gut brain microbiome axis in the in humans is is an extremely important piece of information. You know, Devin, it's so good to hear you say this because your uh, awakening, I'm many, many years behind you on this. And I didn't have the privilege of going down to Branson, Missouri. But the bottom line here is I became just plain old disinterested in it because I heard so much negative talk about it. It's like enzymes can't fix anything. You know, you've got this problem with this gluten and casein. And these two protein, long protein chains are just going to go down there and tear your gut up. And you can't break them apart. You just don't even mess with them. And that's hocus pocus, just what you were, what you were talking about. Yeah. And then what happened? So I just stayed away from it until I ran across your work. And I said, we got to get this guy on and talk to him because this is something that I know is not just me. I mean, this is, and yes, you've been to Dan and there are a number of people who, who work with uh, specific uh, spectrum kids all the time. But a guy like me, who's kind of on the edge, I, I do work with spectrum kids. I've got a whole specific way of doing it with methylation and Bill Walsh and all that. I'm really interested in, in how to understand those uh, transporter proteins on the presynaptic nerves and and getting all that sort of stuff done. But the idea of actually changing that gut, changing that gut physiology by changing the food that comes down is going to, I would say, significantly change so many things about that, not only the person's mind, but their overall ability, their energy, and their nutritional status. It would just bring, it'd bring more things on. I would imagine that the gut physiology, the actual lining of the gut, would improve in addition to just breaking up the proteins. Do you have anything on that? What happens? Yeah, actually, there's a number of things related to uh, intestinal permeability, or in layman's term, what they call leaky gut. But whenever you have an inflammatory process going on, the spaces between the cells become larger. And mm -hmm. so things that normally would stay in the gut come out and get into the systemic circulation. And they can create havoc anywhere, including the brain. So anything that reduces inflammation, reduces the dysbiosis in the gut is going to help. And we tend to think of things as systems rather than looking at everything as part of a whole. So everything mm -hmm. works together. They've just completed the human genome and they were surprised at how simple the, or the, how, actually how few genes we humans actually have. I think we have about 26,000, whereas a, a rice plant has like 46,000. Oh, really? So does that mean the rice is smarter than we are? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the same thing happens. The, the complexity of the bacteria in our gut 
their genomes are actually much more complex than a human genome. So you've got 100 trillion bacteria in the gut, different bacteria, and they all have different genomes. And uh, that's added to ours because all those genes produce proteins and enzymes and, and substances that we don't. And they have an effect on all the system, not just the gut, not just the food being processed. They're not just there to help us break down food. They produce things that go to the brain and feed back onto the brain. I remember just as I was leaving the lab in St. Louis, I was, uh, because we had just found the endogenous cannabinoid uh, called anandamide, which turned out to be a lipid-like substance found in the gut. So that actually started me. I was actually going to go into a field called psychoneuroimmunology, wow. how the immune system and the gut and the brain are all Totally, definitely all an interest of mine and a lot of our listeners. That's so darn interesting. Yeah, and lo and behold, I get into the autism community, which involves all three of those things. So yeah. I, it was a perfect storm yeah. in uh, education and experience coming together. And uh, to, to help solve a problem. Now, let me ask you another question because there's so much interesting in this conversation. We have interviewed a number of individuals who are also interested in the gut brain connection from the point of view of a variety of other maladies, including things like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, traumatic brain injury, pain, and the big, the large rubric <laughs> of pain. You know, the question is. For me, and uh, I know a number of our listeners, uh, ASD is an uh, autism spectrum disorder is a, a very complex disorder. And in, in that, as you were talking, you were talking about, hey, here's what you can do with a gut that directly affects the brain. Now, let me ask you this larger question. Do the enzymes that we're talking about, enzymes that you, you have to have a specific enzyme for a specific malady. That's the first question. I'll ask you that in a second. And the other one is, What's the application of specific enzymes for these other somatic conditions, which aren't necessarily directly related to autism, but can be sisters of autism, as it were? So number one, do you, do you make specific recommendations for specific maladies? That's number one. Yeah, I look at it this way. There's around 25 different enzymes available commercially that you could put in any given enzyme supplement. You can they're break down in, into three different categories. So enzymes to break down proteins, enzymes for carbohydrates and starches, and enzymes for fats. So you look at the particular malady, what's causing the problem? So in the case of proteins, we have wheat and dairy, uh, gluten intolerance, not celiac disease. We're just talking about non-celiac gluten intolerance, which is much more prevalent. And we have people complaining about you know, when they eat a lot of wheat products, they get foggy minded, foggy brained, and uh, can't just seem to think clearly. So you say, okay, well, if it's a protein, if causing the problem, you, you want to look at using a uh, blend or several different proteolytic enzymes, enzymes that break down proteins, and basically start chopping those proteins up in the stomach, which, by the way, is a safe area because there's very little absorption that goes on in the stomach. Especially, no, there's no peptides and protein absorption occurring in the stomach. Which would uh, occur in leaky gut. Just to, That's one of the reasons. Right, you're... yeah. And that's why if a child is sensitive to wheat and dairy and they have an infraction, you've got a window of opportunity because the food's going to stay in the gut for three hours or so. So you can add these acid-stable enzymes, let them do the work. And uh, they work very quickly. They can do that. And by the time the stomach empties, you've defused the bomb, so to speak. Mm -hmm. so you, don't have, you don't have this rush of peptides or improperly broken down proteins right, right. coming into the system. They're all down, and you're, the, the whole idea behind digestion is to break down raw materials so that our body can use them. So the whole idea, if you're, we're adding extra cutting knives, chainsaws, machetes, whatever, to the mix to break proteins, carbs, and fats down to their basic molecular structure. And that way, then the body can then reuse those as raw material to make its own part. So you approach it from that standpoint. If you're, if, you know, you're talking about if you and I were at that age, probably where we're lactose intolerant, because lactase, the enzyme that breaks down lactose and the sugar in milk, starts, it's one of those enzymes that's programmed to start decreasing in production around age six. 
because we've evolved to believe that by that time we're weaned and we're eating steaks and veggies <laughs> and whatever. So we don't need the, our genes have evolved to where, well, they don't need that enzyme anymore. But we, being who we are, we start eating cheese and milk and dairy and, and we find that we can't handle it because we're lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. So you take an enzyme, an oral enzyme uh, or oral lactase that's acid stable and it starts breaking down the, the lactose and you don't have the, the cramping and bloating and diarrhea that's associated with, with the problem. So you have to figure out what the causative agent is and then assign the, the correct enzyme or sometimes it's multiple enzymes to do the job. That's great. That is exactly what I was asking. So do you have a, a chart for that? So for example, like I'm just going to tell you about myself now, and you can, you can tell me what, what you think about it. So we do testing all the time. We see a lot. Of, we're, I'm really interested in treatment failure. And we see, you know, these are, some are ASD, some are developmental delay, but they're not all kids. We see adults that have been seeing everybody. They've tried them on every antidepressant under the sun. They've had them on a stimulant and nothing is working, period. And we go in and test them. We do Great Plains. We like Great Plains. They do a great job with IgG and oats. And we do both IgG and oats pretty routinely. If um, My favorite three are IgG, uh, Walsh, and oats, kind of in that order, because the Walsh is going to tell us about the neurotransmitter swamp. And then IgG is going to tell us about which foods and food sensitivities. And the oats are going to give us the breakdown down the road of all the different things that have happened. And obviously, with just an easily measurable urine. Having said that, then the question is, and this you've just answered a little bit, so if I see a person who is predominantly casein sensitive and I put them on a diet, that's one thing. But if I can also give them a specific enzyme system that works on casein, then I'm going to have a double guarantee that if they happen to have a particular fascination for milk and milk products, then you got, a, you got an insurance policy and it could work. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and um, you actually, by mentioning the uh, organic acid testing, last few weeks I've actually been doing a lot of research on the different acids produced by different probiotic bacteria in the gut based on the prebiotic that they're exposed to. And this mm -hmm. is, this, you'll, you'll find this interesting. The end result of carbohydrate breakdown in the gut by bacteria that, by our gut bacteria, is predominantly lactic acid. I like that. And actually, that's oftentimes not good. That's associated with certain um, maladies and such. So there's several different acids that can produce. And you can change the type of acid produced. Say if you want less lactate and more acetate, you could use uh, fructo oligosaccharides as your prebiotic coupled with, uh, with a bifidobacteria. Whereas a lot of lactobacillus bacteria tend to produce uh, lactic acid as, as a metabolite. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these, I'm reading articles now that are indicating that based on the type of acid produced by your gut bacteria, you're getting compounds in the system that have an effect on mood and cognition. So to me, you may want to change a person based on their particular mindset or their attitude or disposition from a lactic producing bacteria to a butyric acid type bacteria, which may oh, Wow, and you can actually do that. You can, yeah, you can. It's, it's fascinating because I love this whole idea of personalized medicine, but we're now revolving it to supplements. Everyone's crazy about probiotics and prebiotics and enzymes, but there's some caution here. You can't just take any probiotic. You can't take just any prebiotic. You have to do, there has to be some research and some understanding. These different species of probiotic, there's one species that works in you and you, does great. If that same species was in me, would be a disaster. And the nice thing is we also found out is that we can now change the microbiome in the gut by changing our diet. And the way we can change our diet, if we are going to change our diet, then we darn well better make sure that we have the enzymes in place to break down what we're eating. Otherwise, it's a waste of time and resources. So it all goes together, again, like a puzzle, but it's starting to make a lot of sense. Well, listen, we're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to ask you a question when we come back, because this, this now we're getting down to where the rubber does meet the road for so many of our listeners. 
And the question is, what can you do? What is the possibility? What are the options? Well, the big thing and it's a little late for me to be talking about this because I've been so interested in listening to you. We got to get this little sponsorship plug in here. The bottom line is, I want to come back and ask you this question. Do you have a specific set of tests that you like to do clinically that you recommend that are going to delineate some of those specific probiotic and, you know, which, which labs do you use? How do you actually do it? That's something we'd like to ask. We're going to just take a quick break and we'll be back in just a moment. Today, the world of mind science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain-body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and clear laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professionals. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSight for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot, they get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences, in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, Dr. Devin Houston, this has been a terrifically interesting conversation. And, and you know, what happens is I get so lost in the conversation. You know, we've, so many interesting things that we're talking about. But what I'm trying to do right now is bring this down to a little more of a specific thing. First of all, do you have on your website, before we even get into the question, do you have a, a, a information on your website that where a person could download and get on top of some of this stuff? Yeah, our website is, is HoustonEnzymes.com. It's more of an educational site. Okay. There's a lot of FAQs, a lot of articles I've written, a lot of um, past webinars and recordings of talks I've given at particular conferences and such. So, and, you know, I think I get asked the same 25 questions (laughs) at every conference. So I pretty much got them up there. Uh, (laughs) That's great. That's fantastic. uh, I'm going to be over there. I can tell you that. So let me ask you this inane question. You're you're so, probably this is one of the 20 questions, but (laughs) do you have a specific set of tests that you think, and we're talking about a lot of different things, and a lot of people are saying, oh gosh, this is such an array, maybe I just can't even mess with it. So we're talking, you and I both know that getting the food sensitivity thing squared away, that's like basic. That's pretty basic. And you have some specific enzymes based on those specific food groups. But then yeah. into this arcane thing, it was a little different over here, when you started talking about probiotics, prebiotics, and so on. Do you have a specific way to measure those particular targets? And if you do, then do they have specific foods? You were talking about foods that you can do. Do you have specific advice for that? Yeah, it's uh, it's a little complex. A lot of it I'm still trying to wrap my head around because it's changing so quickly. We're just getting kind of uh, overrun with information and, and trying to to assimilate it with what we've already known and changing our uh, thinking on some things. But we do, I get a lot of people who, who present to me a list of things that they're allergic to. They've gone to the doctor and they've had these food allergy tests done and they mm-hmm. are amazed. They found, you know, you know, I said, the doctor says I'm allergic to carrots. I've been eating carrots for, for years and I don't think it does anything, but the test came back and said, I'm allergic to carrot. And so I always say, well, okay, take it with a grain of salt because our testing is so sensitive now that 
there was probably some period in your life where your intestinal tract was a little more permeable and some of that carrot got out and your body formed an antibody to it and the body remembers. So there's always a certain amount of antibodies circulating. And these tests are so sensitive that it just showed up. So I asked, you know, usually the test is ranked from a, like a zero to five. And so I said, well, give me the number. And I said, well, they said it was a two. I said, well, that's not, you know, that's really not very high. So, uh, you know, I say, don't worry about it. So there's the pragmatic real life situation. Other testing that, that I like, uh, uh, again, I, I believe Great Plains has a lot of this, is, is the testing for organic acids. Sometimes mm-hmm. stool testing is necessary as well. You have to see what's, what's coming out before you know what's to put back in. Basically. <laughs> so uh, that can tell a lot. And again, I don't, I'm not a clinician, so I, I don't get that much on that end. There are some common sense things, and there's a lot of people uh, who are a lot smarter than me, Bill Walsh and, and uh, or, uh, Bill Shaw, uh, Dr. Shaw yeah. is one, uh, mm-hmm. does a lot of that stuff. But you want to look at things like cholesterol, short chain fatty acids, in the because that gives you an idea of what's being broken down and what isn't. Things that get broken down properly will get converted to their end products uh, as they get into the metabolic pathways. Mm-hmm. If they're not being broken down, then you're going to see it as waste. And a lot of parents tell me, you know, they, they check their child's uh, toilet or after it goes to the toilet and they see whole foods floating around, you know, mm-hmm. Lettuce, mm-hmm. chunks of corn or carrots. And so that immediately says, okay, am I, I'm obviously not breaking down or digesting everything yeah. I eat. So yeah. that's okay. Then we look at going to uh, specific types of enzyme product. A lot of these kids are already on some sort of diet, so we can kind of tailor certain of our types of of our products to to those foods or those particular diets. But some we want to get something. um, I personally favor targeted focused enzymes. Like if it's a protein problem, then let's get something that's going to break down the proteins. Mm -hmm. If it's a carb problem or starch problem, let's put the enzymes that bust up the starches. But in a lot of cases, you're just not sure. So in that case, you go with a broad spectrum enzyme product that contains certain amounts of all three types of enzymes. Yeah, yeah. And one of the more important thing is, since more people are taking prebiotics, they're they're taking more fiber and different types of fiber, we don't produce the enzymes in our guts to break down fiber. We don't produce cellulase or xylanase, which is another type of uh, cellulase type enzyme. Mm-hmm. These are very important in converting insoluble fiber to a more soluble form. And mm-hmm. the certain bacteria like, like those better than, than others. So mm-hmm. that gives them some that you can stimulate certain bacteria to grow better in your gut by giving them certain kinds of fiber and getting them broken down. Now you got to be careful because if you don't, if you use the wrong prebiotic fiber and you have the wrong gut bacteria being the predominant species in there, then you may not, you may get some results that you don't like. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a lot of uh, thought put into the whole process and it's going to involve, yeah, you've got to test for what you can and then you've got to make sure your observations are there. And, you know, I always encourage people to keep a journal of what they eat because they'd be surprised what they don't remember eating. Mm -hmm. And that can have a, a, huge effect on on uh, the outcomes of, of whatever they're trying to fix. Well, especially if you've got the weapon to shoot at the target, which is really an interesting thing as far as I'm concerned, because, you know, to, to, until this conversation right here, it was like, just do the diet and forget it. And this is so helpful to a lot of people. I think it's really very cool that you're, you're talking about this because you said so much here that's going to be so useful. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to your website and look and see if you have any downloadable PDFs. I want to make sure I include a general P, even though you're into targeted, a PDF and put it on the show notes so people can download it and stay connected with you because I think it's just such great information and people need to be on this because otherwise we're kind of whistling in the dark. And then, you know, this is, this is a very big deal. So in closing then, Devin Houston, Dr. Devin Houston, do you have anything else you want to cover as we wind up here? I'm going to throw out a, a, a word that I want people to remember because I think it's going to be a term we're going to hear a lot more in the future. And the term is psychobiotics. And wow. it's basically looking 
at the importance of probiotic and psychiatric disease. So uh, just as we, a lot of us had predicted early on before anyone had heard of the word microbiome, we predicted that we would, that there was two-way communication between the brain and the gut. And lo and behold, that came to pass. And now, so now, and I'll, I'll give you a, a quick, quick, when I was in grad school, I was told, stay away from any research dealing with poop or gut stuff. <laughs> because, it, yeah, it's just, you don't want to do it. And it's just all been done and it's boring and you can't get any funding for it. Well, man, were they wrong? That's mm-hmm. the hottest areas now. And so the gut is very important. And I, I think... You know, you can't look at just one thing, but this combination of diet, enzymes, probiotic, and prebiotic, it's all going to be rolled up into the whole um, shemil of psychobiotic. As they say in Philadelphia, the whole mishpuka. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's a better word. I'll go with that. <laughs> well, listen, Devin, thank you so much for coming on board. This is great. You know, if you have something else down the road, this has been such an interesting conversation. And I really did feel uncomfortable interrupting you because you were saying so many excellent things, so many useful things that people can take right down to where they live and breathe. And it's really, I mean, this is a little bit effusive, but I do think it's inspirational. I think what happens when you get a guy like you who's been out on the front, on the frontier in such paradoxical places as Branson, Missouri, and you actually figure out some really, really cool stuff. By the way, are you in Branson now? Where are you located? No, I'm about three hours from Branson. I'm actually in Northwest Arkansas. That's where, uh, Actually, my family was based there, and when we knew that we were going to start our own company, we Mm -hmm. decided to just go back to our roots, and uh, it's a great place. We we love it. It's a small town, rural. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of guy I am. I I don't mind visiting the big city, but I'd rather not live there. That's really cool. So you're near uh, Bull Shoals Lake then? Oh, yeah. Several lakes. My father had a cabin down on Bull Shoals, so we we would fly out of St. Louis and fly down there to the cabin. There you go. And go fishing for uh, for bass down there in, in Bull Shoals Lake. Yeah, they're running now. <laughs> yeah, I bet they are. Well, this is such an interesting conversation, Dr. Devin Houston. Thank you so much. If you have something else, hey, Parker, here's another thing that's really hot. It'd be interesting. We'd love to have you back on. Really great. Anytime. Thank you, my friend. All right. You have a good evening. You too, Chuck. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.